Well, hello there, and again, welcome to another session here on Biblical News Updates and Commentary. Well, by virtue of the headlines that we just introduced to you, and I trust that you read, you can see Pope Francis got himself in a hellacious controversy. Oh yeah, it wasn't long before some time ago that he found himself in the midst of a major firestorm. That's right, and no pun intended, but what he said? Really, it turned up the heat. What did he say? Well, as the headlines portrayed, one thing he said, there was no hell of all things. Get this, and if that wasn't enough, bad souls, people that don't make the grade, folks that don't get into heaven, well, they just disappear. Oh yeah, they just vanish, vamoose, you know, like up in a pink mist. I mean, my friends, I don't know if you realize this or not, but those kinds of statements coming from the Pope himself, I mean, these are major controversial comments. And as I say, coming from the head of the Catholic Church of all things, including even the Protestants, because let's face it, many of the Protestant denominations, including you evangelicals, have adopted and embraced this Catholic teaching have you not, of this place where eternal punishing occurs. By virtue of those who don't make it into heaven, they are eternally punished by Satan's minions, his demonic host, his demonic kingdom for all eternity. Those human beings are constantly being tortured and tormented, torn apart and filleted over and over, feeling the pain and the, and the continued tragedy of dying and being resurrected back. I mean, on and on. You, you make up whatever you want to make up, but this is a place allegedly that Protestants as well as Catholics has foisted on the traditional Christian community as a place where eternal punishing occurs. So as I said, for the Pope to say no hell, that souls, bad souls that don't make it into heaven just vanish, this cuts across centuries centuries, my friends, of doctrinal construction and strategic development of these particular theological ideas and beliefs. However, according to this atheist 93-year-old journalist named Eugenio Scalfari, of all things, writing for the La Repubblica newspaper, and admittedly it is kind of a, you know, liberal newspaper, nevertheless, when that story hit the streets that the Pope said there's no hell and that bad folks just disappear. I'm telling you, it was like the Vatican went ballistic. I mean, it was DEFCON 1. They were trying to figure out what in the world did he say? What are we going to do? How are we going to spin this? we got to reframe it. He didn't say that. He didn't mean this. And they even attacked old Eugenio. And they said, oh, yo, Eugenio, he, you can't trust Eugenio. He, he doesn't do these interviews with a tape recorder. He just does it out of memory. You know, he's 93 years old. He's a little bit, you know, uh, besides himself. He's done this before, even in the past when he was a younger man, when he interviewed the other popes. He put words in their mouth, and that's what he did here. He put in words in Pope Francis's mouth, you know. So you can't trust Eugenio, but that didn't discourage Eugenio. No, no, no. Eugenio, he held his ground. He dug in. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm quoting the Pope, and this is what he said. The Pope said, there is no hell, unquote. And he also said that the disappearance of sinful souls disappear. That's right, it exists, unquote. That's what he said. And Eugenio, he didn't get rattled. He did not get discouraged. He just went ahead and he insisted and he dug in claiming that the Pope said that. Well, to the credit of the Catholic Church, as many of you know, because we're some now time has passed with all of this occurring, they've done an admirable job of kind of covering it up, keeping it down to a brush fire, and it never did, quite frankly, gain any legs. I mean, it didn't turn into a forest fire because by virtue of the kind of statement that that is and what it portrays and portends compared to what they teach and have been teaching for centuries, again, if not millennia, I mean, that could have been, pardon the pun, all hell could have broke loose, if you know what I'm saying, but it didn't. And consequently, they were able to rescue, they were able to preserve this doctrine that finds its roots, by the way, if you do a little study on it, in 
pagan theology. Oh yeah, that's right, my friends. It's embedded deeply in pagan roots and comes forward through these sun god worshiping religions that preceded Christianity by many, many hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. But putting all that to the side, it does present an interesting question. And I would think all of us would begin to tumble to this, that regardless of what Pope Francis may have said, the fact remains, I would think all of us would be asking ourselves at this point, what does the Bible say? Where is it located in the Bible? Where's the book? Where's the chapter? Where is the verse? Now, my friends, I'm telling you, knowing what allegedly Pope Francis made mention of and listening to his alleged quotes by Eugenio Scalfari, I can't help but to say that if he did say that, and I'm saying if, if he did say that, and old Eugenio didn't take him out of context or didn't put words in his mouth, but the Pope, he actually, Pope Francis actually did say that. Well, then you know what? Now, I know this may be hard for some of you to take. It may be hard for some of you even to agree with or understand. But the fact of it is, I'd have to agree with him. Because you know what? The Bible does not teach such an idea of a place existing where human beings are tormented and tortured, eternal punishing going on, under the supervision, I mean, think about it, under the supervision of Satan the devil, who has all of his field generals and staff sergeants running around with pitchforks or fire-branded arrows or whatever they use, box cutters and knives, wh whatever it may be, to cut flesh in human beings so they can incur pain on these people who didn't make the grade and uh, get accepted into heaven. And so this is going on allegedly under the supervision of Satan the devil. But you can't help but to tumble to this either once you begin to think this through logically. And if you critically think it through, you've got to come to the conclusion, do you not, that God's allowing it. And if God's a loving God, which we know he is, why, why would he allow such a place to exist under the supervision of a fallen archangel named Satan the devil who has his army of demons running around doing all of these things. Now I know, I know many of you claim that, well, Bill, that's not exactly true. There, there are some legitimate arguments about justifying and actually proving the fact that there is indeed a place where eternal punishing occurs. And I don't have a lot of time in this venue to go through, dissect, and explore all of those arguments and questions. And of course, and I'll, I'll give that to some of you with regards to your traditional teachings and traditional understandings of allegedly this teaching being found in your Bible. Because right now I just don't have the time to digress into some of those. But I do want to take some time on one major area in the Bible of which is used often by many traditional Christians today, be they Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, doesn't matter what denomination or what flavor you're coming from with regards to your belief in Jesus Christ, that use this particular section in Scripture to justify this alleged doctrine, this teaching that hell does indeed exist as a place where, a place, a location where, eternal punishing occurs. So with that, let me turn your attention over here to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and we're going to find here the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Now many of you are familiar with this story that we're about to engage in here, and I want to uh, go ahead and cover it, though, and take some time in some detail uh, with it. Chapter 16 is an interesting chapter. It deals with some stories. The first story is uh, respecting the unjust steward. And in this story, essentially what Jesus is explaining is some economics and how they relate to using wisdom and how this unjust steward was able in using some wisdom to ingratiate himself back into his rich um, 
owner's graces and basically regain his credibility. But Jesus goes down through this chapter and he essentially focuses, and in verse 15 the focus is kind of centralized right here when Jesus says this, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of of God. This, this is the crux. This, this here is a fulcrum of this whole chapter in regards to what Jesus is trying to teach by virtue of the story of the unjust steward as well as the story that we're about to enter into with Lazarus and the rich man. And what is that? And that is basically you need to behave justly. You need to behave properly because in many cases because we're so selfishly oriented that much of what we do is an abomination in the eyes of God. And Jesus proceeds now with another example in the story here of Lazarus and the rich man. Drop down to verse 19. Luke 16 verse 19 we read, There was a certain rich man <clears throat> which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man, he died too and was buried. Okay, he was buried. We pick it up, and in hell, the Greek word used here translated into the English hell is Hades. Hades is very indicative of where you get buried. You're buried in a grave, a hole in the ground. The Hebrew counterpart to this is Sheol. Essentially, it means a hole in the ground, grave, Hades. It has nothing to do, my friends with a place where eternal punishing occurs. So here the rich man wakes up. He lifts his eyes. He's in the hole in the ground. He opens his eyes and he looks and he finds himself in mental anguish. That's what the English word here from the original Greek means. He finds himself mentally disturbed over what he's looking at. And he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And in this particular case, this doesn't mean some kind of surreal, uh, spiritual embodiment of where Lazarus is inlaid into uh, Abraham. It has nothing to do with that. It has actually to do with the Greek word coming from the descriptive word of bay. That's right, like a bay, of, uh, an ocean bay where it has a lot of amenities of being able to consume and provide a certain service or a certain condition by which there is opportunity for amenities and enjoyment. And in this particular case, what the rich man is essentially recognizing is Lazarus is at bay with Abraham. He's in his graces. He's embraced. They're, they are together. They're on the same team, so to speak. And, and the rich man recognizes Abraham and Lazarus are cohorts. They are together in this situation. And so in recognizing that, he says in verse 24 of Luke 16, he cries, the rich man does, and he says, Father Abraham, <clears throat> have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. So now the rich man, seeing that Abraham and Lazarus seem to be together, he appeals and attempts to leverage Abraham to tell Lazarus to come over with some water on the tip of his finger and put it on his uh, tongue. He says, cool my tongue. For I am tormented or grieved in sorrow. That's what the uh, Hebrew or the Greek, I'm sorry, the Greek means here. It means he's grieved. For I am grieved and sorrowed in this flame. Now, the, again, this preposition in could easily, my friends, be translated at. It could be translated about. It could be translated before or even for. In other words, it could read for I am tormented at this flame, or I am tormented or grieved and sorrowed about this flame, or for I am 
uh, grieved and sorrowed before this flame. The point of it is, and here's what I want to mention, my friends, if I was in the midst of a flame of fire, I wouldn't be asking somebody to bring on the tip of their finger a drop of water and put it on my tongue. I would be telling you, hey, get the fire department out here. Open up the fire plugs. I mean, bring out the four inch hoses. And I mean, squelch this fire, put it out. It's burning me up. Obviously, by virtue of the conditions being described here, what you've got is the imagery of a man who wakes up in the hole in the ground, in the grave. He sees the manifestation of Abraham and Lazarus, of which he recognizes as the guy in front of his gate in the life he had before. And by virtue of looking at a flame of fire, becomes mentally grieved, sorrowed, and disturbed over what he's seeing. And so consequently, as any human being would in that kind of a condition and set of circumstances, guess what? Your mouth goes dry in shock. Does it not? Have you ever been in shock? I've been in shock. Some people call it cotton mouth, you know, where you're just, wow, you can't believe what you're looking at. You're stunned. You're astonished or astonished over whatever it may be. And guess what happens oftentimes to a person when they're found in those circumstances? Their tongue goes dry. And so it's very logical for somebody to say, hey, put some water on my tongue. But at any rate, I digress a little bit, but I wanted to take a moment here just to add some context to what we're reading. So he goes on and he says in verse 25, but Abraham said, mm, son, son, remember, remember that you in your lifetime received uh, good things and likewise Lazarus received evil things. But now he's comforted and you are in anguish or you are grieved. Now, this is a benchmark in this chapter, or in this story, I should say. This is a turning point. It's a watermark in the story because what Abraham is telling this guy, the rich man, formerly the rich man, is that in your life, when you were living physically in that life, you had it good. And guess what? You didn't lift a finger to help Lazarus. And so now the tables have been turned and now you're grieving, you're in torment and anguish. And guess what? Lazarus is having comfort and finding peace. So the rich man changes the subject. This is an interesting story. He says in verse 26, or I'm sorry, he didn't change the story yet. He'll change the story in 27. But let me go on 26 here because Abraham continues after he mentions this uh, fact of the tables being turned. He says in verse 26, besides all this, Abraham continues to describe the situation. Between us, that's you there, is a great gulf. This is a chasm, a tremendous expanse, a space that cannot be navigated, he says. It's fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. You can't make it from where you're at in the condition and the material that you're in to where we're at in the condition and material that we're in. It's too much of a change. You didn't qualify. You can't obtain it. You are in a condition for what it is, for the time that you are and in. We are in the condition for the time that we're in. Consequently, this chasm that's between us, these differences and disparity of circumstances cannot be negotiated, cannot be navigated, cannot be changed. You're there, Mr. Rich Man, and we're here. That's what he basically is telling him. And so he says, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. And so now, to my point before, the rich man gets it. And so he changes the subject. He goes and kind of shifts gears a little bit. And in the story, Jesus describes the following in verse 27. Then he said, that's the rich man, he said, I pray you therefore then, therefore, Father Abraham, I pray you, he says, that you would send him to my father's house. Because you see, I've got, verse 28, five brothers. 
I've got five brothers, and that he may testify, that is, Lazarus to them, lest they also come into this place of sorrow, grief, and anguish that I find myself in. So he's looking out for his family, his brothers. He wants his brothers to be forewarned that they can avoid this because what this rich man is now contending with and what he's seen and visually attempting now to experience is not a happy place to be. So he's looking out for his family. Probably one of the first times the guy ever thought about someone else besides himself, going back to verse 15, verse 15 of this chapter, because that's what these stories, be it the just steward or the unjust steward and or this one, is all about. It's to get your mind off yourself and look at other people's needs. And so now this rich man is. He's looking at the needs of his five brothers. But Abraham says, verse 29, Luke 16, he says unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man volleys back. He says, no, 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 Father, Abraham. But if one went from the dead, they would repent. They would change. Now, this next verse, which is the last verse of uh, the story, kind of also expands out and beyond the subject here of which is being addressed. The fact of it is it goes beyond that in the larger scope and actually Jesus prophetically even, you could make the case, is alluding to himself of one who will later on in the future come back from the dead and people still won't believe it like so many on planet earth today. That we tell the story, we explain the gospel, that Jesus resurrected from the dead and through Christ you can have salvation, but who hears our words? That is really the question. And here in verse 31, we read, And he said unto him, If they hear not, this is Abraham, Moses, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And as I said, I won't belabor the point, but the fact remains that today we have, what, 7 billion people on this planet? And there's roughly 2.34, maybe 5 billion who claim the name of Christ. And out of those Christians, how many really believe that Jesus rose from the dead? And yet some will claim that he did, but they'll ignore the prophets and they'll ignore Moses. They'll say, the law has nothing to do with us anymore today. Jesus did it all for us. He nailed the law to the cross, Moses, so to speak. And as far as what the prophets say, eh, we can mitigate their statements because, quite frankly, the only one we really need to listen to today is Jesus because he's the one who did it all for us. My friends, there is just so much to learn just from this story of Lazarus and the rich man, but times run out on me. But what I would like to do before I go is offer you a free offering. All you've got to do is hit us on our website at www.cgi.org or email us at info at cgi.org or give us a phone call at 903-939-2929 between the hours of 9 a.m and 4 p.m. Central Time in the U.S. That's Texas time, by the way, where we are, Tyler, Texas, our home office where our literature comes from. And ask for this free piece of literature. It's a small article, easily read in one sitting, called Lazarus and the Rich Man. And the reason I'd like you to get it is because it's a study paper. It'll go into more detail than what I've been able to go through and give you additional material to consider and to think critically about and to perhaps be motivated and compelled to explore some other venues about this story. And I challenge all of you, uh, uh, before we close here, to look into your Bible and really try to find that book and that chapter and that verse where there is a description of such a place, a place where eternal punishing is going on. 
Because as far as I know, and this article of Lazarus and the Rich Man will help you come to understand that really the wages of sin, my friends, is death. So my friends, this is Bill Watson reminding you always, take some time to critically review and investigate the topics, especially doctrinal topics in your Bible. This is certainly one that merits your attention. So until next time, we'll see you right back here on another edition of Biblical News Updates and Commentary.